All right, my name is Steve Vita. Uh, I'm a land surveyor in Green Bay. Uh, I own a company called Mountain Associates with some other partners. Uh, most of my stuff we do up in is up in Brown County. Uh, I've been doing this for about 25 years, land surveying, and a couple years of school at NWTC in Green Bay. Uh, and I got involved into a, a lawsuit just be a survey and a client that I had up in, up in Green Bay. And that's kind of where this all came from. I'll kind of, I'm going to probably move a little bit fast through this. There's, last time I did it, it took me about two full hours to do it. I think I have about an hour and a half, right? About an hour and a half, okay. So I'll move through it a little bit. It's, some of it gets a little, I'll say, confusing. It's written the way it's written. Hopefully I can uh, uh, smooth it over and keep it over the long for you. And if you get lost, please raise your hand. Or if you have questions, raise your hand. Uh, there's kind of a lot that happens in this thing. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it, and uh, the subject is my property, or my beachfront property is no more. Uh, this is up in Towns, and there was a lawsuit that uh, kind of happened. Again, I got involved into because we did some survey work up there. Um, it's on the, it's on Bass Lake up in O'Connell County. Um, the case was kind of over riparian rights and kind of just some, some family families that didn't get along anymore. Um, there was three families that were involved in this lawsuit, and it, it was over kind of a beach area that they all shared and enjoyed together. They had a dock there, and they had their boats there, and all that stuff. And they all used it, uh, and they all were really good friends at the time. Um, the property, uh, the three people involved. I was actually working for Hendricks, who's in the middle of this uh, of the map here. Uh, we had the Denobles on the right or the east, and we had the Pampers who were on the left. Um, the, piece of, the piece of waterfront that we're talking about, or the beach that we're talking about, is actually right here. I have some pictures later, I'll show you what, what it actually is. But it has to do with really, you know, this, this property line right here is kind of a big issue when there's an easement, a whole bunch of stuff that I'll run through. But that's kind of the bulk of work, what it all is. Um, there's a little bit of property here. It's harder to see here, but um, there's a little bitty bit, which is above the ordinary high water mark, which is kind of where this whole thing's going to go. And get, uh, this is an error photo what it looks like. You can see a little bit better what the beach actually looks like. In blue here I have uh, actually my client's property um, was the Hendricks. But you can see the beach here. It's a really nice piece of beach. And they, like I said, they all had a doctor. They shared it, enjoyed it. And these properties, uh, Camper moves to the left of the blue property. And the Hendricks who owns this piece of property. That's really their only water furnace that they have uh, uh, to this lake. That's how they use it. That's what they for obviously is all these things we all enjoy on the beach. Um, the family tree. There's uh, again three families involved. We have Mitchell and Kathleen Hendricks. We have their son Jacob, uh, the Pampers, Dan and Lori, and they have daughters Ashley and Amber, and they have Joe and Dan and Opal. Um, as I get more into this, they all kind of get involved because of the, the way this is set up. Um, one thing to note here is uh, Kathleen and uh, Lori, her sisters. Um, so, as you see this thing unfold, you'll kind of start to see what happens. <laughs> um, the Pampers and the Hendricks got together and they bought about 40 acres up here. Uh, one deed, one big piece of property. And uh, they started to use it, hunt together, they enjoyed it with their families, their kids. And there was a trailer on the property they shared and they put in a dock on this piece of water frontage. And it was the greatest thing ever. So this is what it looked like originally when they purchased it. I mean, I show all the properties on here, but, but originally they purchased this whole thing, and I refer to it as a trust land because as we move through this thing, they eventually put it into a trust for their children. Because uh, obviously their cousins and the sisters, they got along at the time and all that good stuff. So um, the one other prop order here, as you can see, is the Noble, which I don't, don't highlight them because it's not part of the original trust property, but that'll all come together here too. So, um, Again, just another shot of the Denoble property uh, in the beach that we were talking about. Um, there's a little bit of property here. I have a great really easy to see. There's a little bit of property that originally was above the ordinary high water park. And that kind of becomes the kind of the big topic of this whole thing is, is that property above the ordinary high water park. This is what it looks like uh, if you're kind of looking northerly at the Denoble property. I'll just go back one here. Your picture is taken from right here. Kind of in a southeasterly direction. So it's actually a really nice piece of water frontage. 
what you can see in this picture too is the noble um, he did a bunch of excavation work in here he cleaned this all up he made a really nice really nice beach out of it did a nice wall um, that's a whole other issue that is being dealt with with, uh, with the dnr so so there's that i won't even get into that part of it they're having some other fun i think still um, so anyway nice piece of property you can see the dock that they have in here there's even a second dock you can see in there which is actually on the noble property but it's kind of a neat, a neat setting the way this whole thing is set up. So, just to kind of run through some of the some of the things going on here. Um, in 1996, when they acquired the property, uh, they set up a trust for their children. And the trust was supposed to be eventually set up for uh, Jacob Hendricks, 50%, and then the other two kids from the other side of the family actually came for 25% each. So, um, the reason I bring this up is you'll see later there were. There were some other deeds that happened uh, that put it into someone else's name. So that's ultimately what it was supposed to be. So they're just, they're just layers upon layers on this thing that it just kept making it worse and worse for everybody. Um, so again, that's what the trust property looked like uh, originally that was set up for the, for the families, the three kids. Um, in 1996, there was a plan of survey done out of the trust property to cut off five acres, 5.10 acres precisely, actually. Um, the survey was done by Wayne Dobrotz. Uh, there was precise language in there that said it was sufficient to cover or encompass 5.1 acres, which, which what it did is exactly what I have in gray, is it went up to this ordinary high water mark of the backwaters of Bastion. Now, now that little strip of beach that I'm talking about before uh, was was not part of this. It didn't, get, it didn't get transferred. So what they did is they took this piece of property out of the trust and they put it into Mitchell and uh, Mitchell Hendricks and Dan Camper's name so that they could build cottage actually what it was. But the key here is that it doesn't acknowledge this little piece of uh, property that was above the ordinary hour high water mark and part of the trust land, which is out at the water's edge. There really isn't any water here that is accessible. It's basically a small field. You, know, you could probably walk through but I don't know why you would. It's just kind of crazy your land. Uh, again, the, going back to the trust, they did set up a trust. In, in 1997, they moved this trust solely into the name of Mitchell R. Hendricks. But I'm not quite sure why they did that, but again, these guys were all really good friends, trusting sisters for sisters. Um, not sure why they did this, but but it became another pickup as part of this whole thing. It didn't actually go into the trust for the kids. It's solely in Mitchell's name, which which as we went through the lawsuit, just caused a whole other layer of issues for them. Um, okay, 1999. Um, Altis to Bomber, this is just kind of starting to set up this mutual property line that these guys have that kind of gets into where the, where the beach comes into play. Um, the De Noble property was set up as part of this transfer. There was a deed written um, for, for this line right here, which actually there was two pieces of property at the time. There was a deed call there, and that deed call came down that line and established that line, and it, it matched up identically with this piece of trust land. Key, the key part of that is uh, the two deeds matched up precisely, and there was uh, there was actually uh, no no meandered property. There was no acknowledgement of this piece of, piece of shoreline in there anywhere. It just said they both came to a point right here and went down that line. It wasn't meandered, so in theory there shouldn't have been any or any um, any way for De Noble to claim any shoreline over that line, in my opinion, or the other way, the trust. Line property beyond that line because it wasn't the Okay, in 2002 we were hired, this is kind of when we got involved in the thing, uh, to split this 5.1 acres up into two pieces so that uh, obviously the Hendricks could build a cottage and the Hamps could build a cottage on the respective pieces. So we came in and did a, did a CSM for them. And again, we just followed this 5.1 acre flood survey that was done before. We didn't acknowledge anything beyond on these lines here, we just went to the back water of the Bass Lake, and we stopped. You know, it's kind of a swamp. So, in theory, all this other property, if there was any, was still owned by the trust. It was kind of my whole basis of my advice to the attorney. You know, the side that I was working on. So, we had done that CSM form um, in October 2003. Um, Bob Garrett now transferred the property to De Noble. This is when he took title. Again, now the third friend moves in next door. Again, he's got two other really good friends, and he purchases a piece of property. It's just a beautiful piece of property. It's on a point on Bass Lake. The water's you know, really neat piece of property. 
Um, so obviously then now the third person came into the picture, they all started short, again sharing that beach and the dock and they all locked their boats there and had their drink every night there and, and all this stuff. So it really made these three pieces very unique to have the ability to use this piece of shoreline. Um, there's no structures at this time looking down to this property because he has a lot of land. His idea was he was going to go in and build, you know, build a really nice house there and call our cottage there. Um, the, the one thing again is the identical call. This, this, when this deed came from, from, from Bomber to the normal now, they continued with the same calls and the deeds. And again, this line here is not meandered. It's just a mutual call to the same property. The distances are the same as the trustee and all those kinds of things. Uh, the only part of this is meandered is actually the water. The actual water part of it here, on the trunk, is meandered. And that's pretty clear in the deeds as they pass through. All right, well, here's kind of where things kind of start. So the fun begins. Mitchell and Kathleen get a divorce. You can all, you know, the, the sisters of Amber, Amber and uh, Amber's wives were both sisters. So when Mitchell got a divorce, that's kind of when, the, when things started to get really rocky, I guess I'll call it, in this whole thing. Um, so, okay, as things move forward, they got divorced, okay, fine. The noble actually wanted to start to try and build his house now, and he realized he didn't have enough, he didn't have any boat footage to build his house, so the county wouldn't issue a building for him without boat footage. Makes sense, there's a gravel driveway going in there, but he didn't own the land. Um, so he approached the noble approached Hendricks, good friend, said, hey, would you sell me this 100 feet of road frontage that has a triangle, we'll attach it to my property, and then I can build my house. You know, this would be great. So, uh, they struck up an agreement. I don't even think there was any money exchanged. They were that good of friends that uh, the only thing that Hendricks had asked for is he asked for an easement in exchange. Give me an easement across your property because you saw the rock wall there now. Uh, he built that nice rock wall and it was a really nice path to get down to the water. They could carry their canoe down there, they docked their boat there, they had their lawn chairs there and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was kind of a neat, uh, neat set up the way they had it. So naturally, uh, it's an agreed because he needed the 100 feet of road finish. He, he said, sure, so, you know, I'll give you an easement back, no problem. So they did that exchange and uh, kind of went through the process. There was an egress, 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 easement granted. Um, and the way they wrote it was kind of unique. The property was only about 100 feet wide. The noble's attorney prepared this easement. And they made it 50 feet wide. I just want to go back to the map. Yeah, they made it 50 feet wide. Again, remember, it's only about 100 feet wide up, in fact, 93, 100 feet wide of the water. It's 50 feet wide along its northern line and along its northwestern easterly line, which was the actual water. I don't know why they wrote it like that, but it's, you'll see later it really became a big problem. But what it did is it restricted this property even more from being able to build. So I don't know why they wrote it 50 feet wide. They only needed about 20, you know. But uh, this is how they wrote it. Uh, the old attorney prepared it. Uh, and the, the other key here was written as, a, as an exclusive easement. In other words, Denoble could not give the right to anyone else across the street to cross it and use the water frontage. Um, it kind of comes, I don't know, I've seen some other things where people will build condos across the street and they'll buy one lot and they'll try and let everybody use that lot because then they can put a great big dock out there and put 100 boats out there for the 100 condos that are across the street. So there's there's some some I'll call it laws for that lack of a better word, about how many docks you can have and all those other things on a piece of water frontage. But by having an exclusive easement, it also limits you as the property owner who, who's allowed to use that. Which again becomes part of this whole this whole mess. So um, you can almost can't grant the right to another individual to use and cross that easement. And remember it's 50 feet wide, and it goes across the whole water frontage and it comes out the whole the whole northern side. That's what it looks like. Um, this is this is uh, coming from uh, down that mutual line between Henderson and Oval, head right towards the water. You can see my property stakes in the back. Right on the water there, property stake. It's kind of a neat little path. Beautiful wall. He has, I don't even know, probably hundred thousand dollars in those landscaping walls. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like. This is what the easement was for: is to be able to use that access way to get to the water for um, for the Henderson. Hammers also used this. Again, they had a path coming through the front yard of, of Hendricks from their property to get to here. That's why they access the water also. 
Um, okay, to clean all that up, we did the easement. Um, they uh, they swapped that climb below to get the 100 feet under the people's property. Um, they needed to defile a CSM and they needed to file those deeds. So Robert Camps came in, prepared a CSM for the Noble and Hendricks, which depicted the new easement. It uh, recorded the two lots as they were after those exchanges happened, um, and then divided those lots into two, two lots, uh, one for Hendricks, one for the Noble, with the final, final boundaries and sizes. At that time, there was no official order in Kyle Water Park determination done, which kind of fills in again later. Um, and it goes back to that beachfront where I thought there was some, originally some beachfront. This mapping does not show any beachfront. Two keys to this this map, this kind of became a big part of this whole lawsuit of, of why the judge ruled the way he did. This is a CSM that happened. You can see the De Normals property lot through here. has the triangle attached to it now, and it has a you can build on now. Uh, one thing that uh, Camp did here, though, is he meandered this piece of water, which I had always called to our attorneys I was working with as the hard call line. You know, uh, the hard call meaning those two properties adjo joined mutually, they had the identical calls, and um, now it's meandered, uh, which which takes on a whole a whole meaning, I guess. Um, one other thing here to note is that when the CSM was done, the owners, all the owners, are required to sign. So, um, De Novo had to sign the CSM, and Hendricks had to see us sign the CSM, acknowledging that they agreed with this language, which, which again, kind of came back to bite them a little bit later. But, you know, ultimately, uh, the property that I'm talking about is this beach is still, in theory, in my opinion, was trust land. It's not really owned by Hendricks, but Hendricks was the executor of that trust. It was his property, and it was his job to you know, keep an eye on it for the trust, if you will. And this this affected that in the end, but we didn't know it at the time. So Mitchell signed this, and life went on. Again, that's what the beach looks like, um, that they were all using. Uh, so then in the end, a quick claim was filed, giving up the triangle. That was just part of the process to finish the CSM. Um, okay, Hendrick's former wife, Amber's wife, current wife, or sisters, as we all know. Um, just to kind of refresh everybody's memory, they got a divorce in 2003. And Mitchell Hendricks eventually married Jill. Now, Jill Hendricks, the new wife, she comes into the picture in 2005. Uh, this is, I think, when the fire really starts. Yeah. Okay, 2008, 2009, there was an argument, and I don't know what was all said, but I knew what the words were. So, so, you know, you can all figure it out from here. Somebody called somebody something. The new wife is here now, the sister in laws here. Um, things just, uh, they weren't going very well, and there were some words exchanged, and, and uh, it wasn't pretty, but it just started this, this landslide of, of things that happened to me. So the first thing that kind of happened, um, they had us come back and mark this property line. This is the property line between Amber and Hendricks. And I'm not even certain of everything that happened. There was three people involved, as I mentioned. There was a lawsuit that people tagged on the lawsuits, and someone else tagged them to that lawsuit. It's just the weirdest thing to keep, keep track of. But so we marked up this line, and now these, these cabins are both there. They're really, really nice cabins. I didn't go take pictures or anything, which I would have, but. Uh, I didn't want to go up there and see if my nose in there anymore. But um, beautiful cottages, four to five hundred thousand dollars in value with water condition. It's kind of the key of this whole thing. Um, so we marked that up. As you can see to the right of my stakes here, uh, you can see a stake just past the garage there. The garage corner is actually over the property line, just a little bit, like a foot or something, if I remember right. Um, that is Hamburg's garage uh, to the right. Hendricks, obviously, garage. You can see the brown pine tree there. That would be um, the Hendricks garage. Okay, things again from this exchange of words <coughs> prior, things just continue to get worse. Uh, that's why we marked this property line because what it was when you go back to that, there was a there's a circular driveway you can kind of see going through here that they both shared. So they come in with their boats. It was great. They could go all the way around, go out the other end of the property, 
well, that, that was going to be stopping for shortly. We knew a lawsuit was coming. So, De Novo filed, a, De Novo filed against Hendricks, stating that the Icarus Egress easement was for limited, or was for a, and limited to Icarus and Egress in the utility of late purposes. Um, so, this is the first lawsuit came actually from De Novo now, because now what's kind of happening is uh, De Novo and Camper were main friends through this whole thing. And, basically teamed up against the Hendricks, and that's kind of how this whole thing kind of came down. So, uh, as I mentioned, the Hendricks were using this beachfront. They had a dock out there. They put their lawn chairs and just go out and hang out there, put their blanket out, sunbathe, picnicking, you know, all the activities that normally would be done on the beach. Um, so, the Nobles were claiming, excuse me, claiming at this time that uh, they had repairing rights to this piece of beach. So there kind of goes back to that survey I was talking about, that meandered line. Now that that land line is meandered, and Hendricks signed that map and said, yeah, this is all fine. So I had to report to CSM. Um, part of the way the lawsuit was filed was that the beach area, the noble is now claiming, hey, it's mine. I have a meandered, meandered line on that side of my property. I have rights to the beach, it's mine, and, and you guys don't have the right to do all these things that you guys are doing. So that's kind of how that uh, rolled out. Um, in July of 2011, we got asked to come back again now. And we had already set property stakes down between the garages over here. But now they wanted us to take this line here and extend it all the way out to the water because that's actually the line that I believe at the time um, was a mutual line, identical call uh, from way back you know, when these two properties were created. I extended it out to the water and I put stakes in and uh, I believed it was a line between those two properties and that Joe and Noble had no no right or claim over that line because there was it wasn't the end of the original deeds and uh, the, the deeds were mutual and identical. So yeah, this is where they started sort of not liking me. I went down by the water, put in a stake, and I put Hendricks and I put the noble with an arrow going each way, and I got a call like they were just mad at the hell. How can you say that's his? And how can you say that's, you know, whatever? And I'm like, because that's what I believe the line is. I'm just a finder of fact. I'm not the judge, you know, whatever. And I, I know Joe personally. We've done a lot of work for Joe also. We did a lot of work for all these people, actually. And um, so he was just furious about this hell. Just a while. Um, so Joe and I filed a court order to have the dock removed. He said, get the dock out of there. After he filed the lawsuit, claiming that they couldn't do all the things they were doing down there. They filed a court order to remove the dock until the ownership <coughs> could resolve the speech. So, so that's what they did. You know, we, we had, uh, oh yeah, this just kind of goes back. This is just another slide. They told them to remove the dock, okay? So if you remember this slide I showed you, we marked up the line between the two garages down the property line. That's, that's the line going down those two property lines. And that's where they put the dock. So that this just fueled up again. Yeah, they put that dock and spray painted that line down there. You can see it. And now that it just started either more flare. I said, well, if you want to be a jerk, well, I'm going to do The dock's huge, you know. The garage actually is angled a little bit towards the Hendricks property. So in order to back out of that garage stall, you actually have to cross that property line to get out of that garage stall. So so he started interfering with Amber's ability to get into stuff in and out of the garage. So of course they got a little more heavy about that. So the dock, the judge now were get the dock out of the back. So, so this was just one thing after another. Just every little thing they could possibly do to anchor each other, they did anything. Um, so the judge ordered that they remove that dock out of there. So so anyway, part of the again, part of this complaint here, third party someone's complaint, they wanted clarification on utility of lake access purposes. So um, Hendricks easement reads that they have exclusive use of this easement. So you can kind of start to see maybe what's going to happen here. Amber's on the left, Hendricks is in the middle. Hendricks has an easement down to the water. And the Noble is friends with Amber over here on the right. And there's an exclusive easement that says only Hendricks can cross it. The Noble doesn't have the right to let any walls cross it, which means Amber. So, um, the word exclusive, that's kind of where that's coming from. Uh, 
uh, a counterclaim against Viola Hendricks saying that DeNoble is allowing Cameron to use the beach via Hendricks' exclusive easement, saying, no, you gave us an exclusive easement, your attorney wrote it, you made it 50 feet wide, and what he did, the one mistake I think he made is he, he actually went down that uh, northwesterly property line, but then he turned it and he also went down the water. So now it didn't allow the noble to get in, give anybody permission to cross it even to get to the water. So they kind of started throwing that in their face and said, you gave us an easement, you gave it an exclusive limit. You know. As this all went on, it was just, uh, obviously there were no friends anymore. Um, Pamper made an offer to the Hendricks just to get this done. He says, uh, if you give me your cottage free and clear of all liens and coverages, we'll dismiss this case. That's a $400,000 cottage with water of course. We'll dismiss the case. That was an offer. It was kind of funny. And I think it was even served like on Christmas Eve. And that's how stupid some of got. Birthdays, Christmas Eve, Easter, that's when things were some summons and filed at their door. So back on the door of Christmas Eve, I think this is the one that came Christmas Eve. Of course, Henry's rejected. Um, I got summons when I was deposed in 2012, and that's kind of when, when they really started moving towards the trial part of this thing. Um, in the summons, amended summons, again, just another part of the thing, uh, Hendricks is claiming that either he personally owned or the trust still owned that beach. Kind of going back to that mutual line thing I was talking about. And this is where I was advising, saying, how can he, he can't possibly own it. You guys have identical deeds. There's no meandered line. Uh, it was obviously upland, highland, uh, well bordering, high water mark when this copy all got created. Otherwise, you know, the surveyor would have been able to set a state, which he says he set at that corner on that mutual line. So, um, so as I as we move through this, that was kind of why I call it a hard call line. Is what, what the term I use for the attorneys. It's a hard call. It's not meandered. That he doesn't have the right to claim over that line. So that's kind of the, the angle that the attorneys took for the Hendricks. Um, the plaintiff, the De Nobles and the Hamperts, are saying, wait a second, you don't own it, Hendricks. The trust actually owns it. Because again, if I go back to that original survey of five acres, the five acres came out of the trust, but it did not go up to this the little beach area. It, it only took five acres, and it didn't, didn't cover anything else. So in the end, the reality is the trust is actually who has to be fighting for this beach but not. So again, another layer. So, um, there was a few things that, uh, in the identification of the incorrect portion of the land that was being conveyed, um, that kind of goes back to how the trust was conveyed versus the five acres of the fade. And I was saying that, hey, the, the, the trust is really the one that owns the property. So, Um, as I was being deposed, another thing that they brought up is they went through every single sheet of piece of paper in my whole file. They took it, they marked it as an exhibit. Anything that I wrote to help, help me ascertain these boundaries through time, anything that I wrote, they grabbed it. So who wrote this note? Did you write this note? I said, no, uh, but I think I Randy wrote that note. Or is Randy the one that Randy wrote? So they, every little note, but one, one note I put, any surveyor here will understand this, but I wrote on one of the pieces of paper that the description doesn't close. And the description I was talking about was a trust description. Um, but it was an old deed, and you know times were different back then. Uh, things were probably written more closely to the nearest foot rather than the nearest hundred like we do now. So I had written that the deed doesn't close. Well, the attorney just jumped all over that. What do you mean by that? So you're saying it doesn't close. You wrote, I had a green pencil or something. I wrote it on some sheet. But it didn't close by like this much in the survey terms. He's that old, it doesn't mean anything really, other than it was written in the nearest foot, so we had to set it for how it closed it, you know. But he jumped all over the fact that I had written that, that he didn't close, which they used against us too. So, all right, some more fun begins. Um, second Amendment, Amendment answer, affirm defenses, counterclaim of third party complaint. Henderson is claiming that Cameron had taken actions to interfere with the exclusive easement rights for example, by placing obstructions in the Serbian tenement. In other words, they blocked the easement, is what this case says. But the funny thing is, um, okay, 
as the fight as the fight continues, there's a car claim to thicken even more. Uh, De Noble had given permission to the Pampers to cross the easement now. A new dock was placed on the waterfront, so you know not only did they block this easement, they put in a different dock. And they're allowing Pampers and the person on the left over here to come down the road, come across the noble property, and get into this um, get into the dock that way. Um, Part of this, the noble's attorney prepared this easement. It, it was supposed to be bulletproof, exclusive. It's 50 feet wide. Again, I don't know why it was that wide, but it was way wider than it needed to be. Um, they, they prepared it, so now they're, the noble's hammered questioning this easement now, and that became another argument because of the way it was written. Um, so it essentially cut off the noble's ability to give anyone the right to cross that exclusive easement, including the hammers, who now also have no usable water because they couldn't get to that beach in any way now. They couldn't come through enters, they couldn't come through campers. So the easement essentially cut them off from having the ability to have the dock. Um, again, this is standing at the water, looking up that neutral line. To the left is the easement, actually. To the left is the normal property. To the right would be um, the Henry's property at the woods, basically. This is what they did. They went and bought about 50 of these. There's, I have a picture, but I don't want, again, I don't want to ask for it again. She's pretty upset about this whole thing. So I made my go on. They went about 50, got about 50 of these, you know, the, the flamingos, the flamingos. And they just put them everywhere in the season. You couldn't even walk down there, were so many of them. Um, but anyway, they put them all into the season. It's the funnest picture you ever seen. But they filled it with these things. They couldn't carry a cooler down there. They couldn't carry a boat down there. Obviously, they tore them all threw them away, but it was just uh, something else that they did to instruct their easement. That was what they were talking about. So, my opinion, okay, what I had discovered is that I had thought that there was a piece of land, upland, above the ordinary high water mark that existed at some point that the trust owned. Uh, based on those two deeds, uh, the way the, the way the ordinary high water mark was drawn back then, there was indication that there was something there. Kind of go back to this, uh, the wall and the denoble excavation and the DNR getting involved. There isn't an ordinary high water mark there anymore. It's gone. I mean, it's been bulldozed. There's a beautiful wall there. My opinion is probably going to fill for that. I scraped it up. I don't know. But there isn't evidence anymore of an ordinary high water mark. It's, just, it's been obliterated, essentially. Um, but through the years, no one paid any attention to that monument that was there uh, that I believe on this piece of upland. Um, we didn't find a monument at that location. However, when we did our survey work, we did our reconnaissance, we you know we, we gathered information about not only the property we were surveying, always the ones next door, section corners, and we gathered all kinds of survey monumentation to help us arrive at an answer for a particular piece of property. We didn't find that property corner there, but we found all the other ones that said that yes, that's right, you know, they all fit together perfectly from a mass standpoint. There should have been a monument it was, it was stated that there was one place there. Um, so again, another another thing that I believe indicated that there was high uh, land above the border and high water mark there. Um, and again, those two deeds match the trust, the original trustee matched and the original going back in time to Noble deed matched exactly. There was no land in mind. So in theory, the Noble should have never been able to claim over that line in my opinion. He had he had um, water furniture on the front of his lot in the north, and there should have been no reason the judge should have given him more water furniture. This, these deeds all went back prior to the 60s. Again, just back to the earth over here, so maybe you can kind of see how these things all start to come together a little bit. Um, if anybody has any questions, from the raise your hand. I don't want to lose anybody, but there's just a lot going on with this thing. Um, again, the in blue is the Hendricks property. You can kind of see what, in theory, this deed says he owns. Um, my, my belief was that the trust he came down here and it actually went up way up over here and it's certainly covered 40 acres. So I believe that the trust owned this part of the land and this whole beach. It was, to me, it was pretty clear that they owned it. The Nola had no claim to it at all. Um, if you read those couple of deeds, again, this just talks about how identical they are. Um, identical. Everything about them said, you know, the, the calls were the same, the distances were the same, everything about them was the same. I refer to it as a hard to call line. It was my opinion that the Nola had right out that side of the property. And uh, the Noble's team even makes reference or it calls in their repairing. It says, do you have 
lamp on the shore of Bass Lake, and here it is. Skulls are going to be. All first way to know. Um, as this thing heated up more and more and more, actually what happened is uh, in one of the in one of the conferences there was four attorneys in there, the three property owners, uh, somebody taking depositions in the whole nine yards. Uh, somebody said the wrong thing and did all just went berserk. He threatened the Hendricks that there ended up being a restraining order for Dr. DeNoble. So we couldn't even have contact with him anymore. So it didn't really, it really wasn't pretty at this point at all. I don't know what the whole thing was about, but we just know that that happened. Um, again, it's all public record, so there was stuff about what I had talked to Joe, the people that I worked for. They're okay if I do this presentation, but it's all public record. She was okay with it. So. Um, usually when you do riparian, Repairing rights, which is kind of starting to boil down to, um, there's an equitable distribution of the repairing. In other words, uh, if if um, you have a high shape piece of property, you also get some some part of the repairing for the water, the use of the water when you do a distribution of this. And there's ways to do it. There's different formulas, but you know, property lines and topography features always cause you to have different ways that you might want to do this. But for the most part, you take a line from point at which you touch the water, draw it to the center of the lake, and that's kind of your repairing boundary. Um, so to me, it was, again, crystal clear that Joe's repairing it was straight out the end of his property. This is something, again, I had in the file, and the attorney just had a hate with this. I don't even know why. But, you know, again, go back to the term. It's, it's a fair and equitable, equitable distribution of the, of the repairing. It was my belief that, well, here's the beach, you get the blue, the blue star. The nobles repairing just went straight out to the lake. That's what the deed said. Uh, the original deed, there was no meandered line over here, so there would be no reason he should have any claim to that. So this is where I, I drew this up in my sketch and meetings with my partners at the office and said, hey, guys, I believe this house should be divided up with the repairing. Uh, there's a piece of beach here that is owned by, I think, the trust, and the trust really should own that piece of property and should just stay with it. Really, they should have it, not at all. So they took this and they entered this into evidence too and they beat me up on this, you know, you know why did you do this? This uh let's go back to the camp survey. That survey is meandered, which means he could possibly have a claim over this high and so anyway, we got beat up a little bit more on the stand with this. Um, again, one thing that was working against us to kind of boil down to this ordinary high water mark. Where was it? It's not there anymore. When Camps did his survey, he meandered that line because there was no ordinary high water mark anymore. But again, I believe the noble manipulators, we know the noble manipulators shoreline, he bulldozed it, made a beautiful wall, and it's gone. So, so it's not there anymore. Again, separate issue. I know they were still dealing with that. I'm not sure whatever happened. I didn't hear anything more about it. But I know there was some big issues and potentially fines going on with that. Um, The reason, the reason I stated that I believe the trust owned that piece of land was because the original uh, 5.1 acre survey down by Dobras that created the, the piece that the Noble and Hendricks had their cabins on, I'm sorry, Hendricks and Hamber had their cabins on, clearly stated that it was only 5.1 acres. And I believe that it just missed that other piece of upland. They just didn't, didn't uh, realize it was really upland, I guess, as well. I'll say for lack of a better word. Um, Plaintiff's asked me if, uh, the plaintiff's attorney asked me if I labeled a JCC as out, uh, orders, names, obviously, and they use that against me. What, what, um, when we do a certified survey map, we're, we're required to show what the planning status is outside of our boundaries. If it's unplanned or it's created by a subdivision plat or another certified survey map, we're not required to put the owner's name on each side of that plan division, just the planning status. Um, their, their attorney beat me up on that too. I didn't have one. I don't think I have the owner's name. I don't know if somehow I kind of believe convinced the judge that he had to have the owner's name. He says, you didn't even state that the, the trust owned this land in your own survey. And I'm like, not required, you know, but they didn't seem to really care about that. So um, so they seemed to lay a lot of weight on the fact that I didn't label and say that this is the adjoining owner's name. I don't know why it's not required. And somehow he convinced the judge that uh, that was a big issue. Again, the whole reason for the massive fight was the Hendricks cabin was 
beautiful place. The Cameron's place is beautiful. Four to $500,000 values on this thing. But if you don't have any water footage, you have nothing. And what do you have? You really have cabin, but you can't get to the water. You can't get to the beach. You can't put your boat in. Well, you could, but you, know, you couldn't you could park it there and use it the same way. Um, it's the same beach that the Cameron's use. So now they're four or 500000 cabin. They don't have water footage either. So I'm not sure, you know, and they weren't sure what they were going to do, but we didn't, we didn't really care going through the car parking process. Um, one thing that I found weird is that I didn't, they didn't invite me. I don't know. I, that's my first experience with the car case when I was on the stand, but I wish I could have listened to all the other expert witnesses as this kind of came through to see. I thought I would have been part of that to help them maybe defend you know, my client at the time, but they never asked me to do that. I wish they would have. I would have liked to hear what they all had to say. Um, Eventually, this thing all boiled down, and the judge, uh, he gave ownership of the beach to the Minotaurs. Um, and he leaned, he leaned a, a lot on that certified survey map that was signed by Hendricks. I, Hendricks signed it, and he said, yeah, I agree with it. So the judge said, you said you agreed with it. You know, whether you were uh, on the behalf of the trust, which was in your name 100%, or was behalf, on behalf of you, you signed the CSM and said, this is right. So there was no ordinary high water mark on that CSM. He signed it, said it was good. He leaned on that really heavily. Um, the judge is saying that both deeds were ambiguous. Kind of going back to my statement before where I said that the deeds didn't close. The judge said, well, they must be ambiguous. You know, to me, not closing uh, as a surveyor by this much and something written that long ago doesn't mean a whole lot. It's more about you know, uh, understanding what not closing means, but they're ambiguous, I guess. So, Another thing that he did not. Um, just something that I noted this was kind of after. Even though he beat me up kind of hard that I didn't show the ownership outside my survey lines, neither did camps. But nothing that came up in the trial, you know, of course, in the judgment. But just something I was kind of mad about. Like, well, you beat me up, but then you used it as you know, your own surveyor, your expert witness. Didn't show any of that on his either. So, um, So then as far as that CSM, I just had it noted here, but nobody ever raised the question about riparian or upland during that CSM process, meaning the older land divisions never went out to that beach area. We just stuck to that five acre piece. Um, and this again is the camp CSM, which he really leaned heavily on. You know, again, just going back real quick, I have a dash line here, which is, this is the original feed line over here, but because he meandered this line, he showed showed what he thought was shoreline here by meandering it and uh, Hendricks signing it and saying, yeah, I agree, that's how it is. Well, now it's meandered. Now there's different rules that apply to meandered property on the water. So the judge leaned real hard on that. And uh, there was nothing else we could do at that point. So as a result, Mrs. Hendricks, she's a realtor. She said her property value dropped after this whole judgment came from 400000 to 200000 um, I know for a fact that Hendricks spent a like ninety to hundred thousand dollar range just on the trial on this whole thing with everything that's going on. So not only did they lose a couple hundred thousand property value, they spent a, nearly a hundred thousand of their own money. And I know for sure that Camper and Dino spent more than that just because of all the little things they kept filing and delivering to their door at their birthdays and all this other stuff. So again, there was still a bunch of other estate issues to settle going back to the Trust was still in Mitchell Hendricks' name, it wasn't in the kid's name. Um, they still needed to divide all that up. Um, but So I didn't, I didn't even get into it anymore in my presentation about that. There was just some other stuff that happened there uh, that had to be worked out. Um, they, they, were, they were trying to work those issues out, so they, what they did is they got into mitigation. So the judgment happened. Uh, they don't own the water punch. They don't own the water punch. That's all said and done. But there were still family issues to work out with this land that they still own. And again, things got really ugly in this, in this mitigation when we tried to work this out. Again, a bunch of attorneys, uh, property owners, and pampered throughout their final life and have the $300,000 right now. And uh, Hendricks went, we'll take it. So all these attorneys heard it, you know, and, uh, you know, all these people in the room heard it, and it was kind of thrown out there, I would say, probably unexpectedly. They didn't know this was going to happen. Being a realtor, she knew that the property wasn't worth crap without this piece of water. So they immediately said, we'll take it. 
but you know, again, with all the stuff that happened, um, they accepted it right there, but they were never sure they were going to close. This, this went on for years, you know, the way the way it, it was just to get to the point uh, to even have that judge decide that the land wasn't theirs. But so they were nervous about this closing. Uh, they said they had set a closing date. Um, they never thought it would happen. They were pretty upset. This is a you know they almost got divorced. But the emotions of this thing was just unreal. You know. Um, so as they moved closer to this closing date, one of their friends called them up and said, "Hey, there's this older couple that has a piece of property on the lake up over here somewhere else. You should go look at it. It'd be perfect for you guys." I'm like, no, we don't. Even we just want this over. We want to escape for a few months, you know, just kind of recoup our lives. Uh, so they kind of said, "No, we don't want to look at it." So what ended up happening is they had, they actually came to the closing, and they closed on like a Friday. They're like, "Now what do we do? You know, they needed to just get out of the house. Let's go for a ride." So they left and said, "Hey, maybe we should drive by this cabin that so and so was telling us about." So they closed on a Friday. They got their three hundred grand. They took off for a ride. Went this cabin and they uh, it was just gorgeous five acres 200 feet of water footage uh, whole log cabin uh, it's like probably a four or five hundred thousand dollar property again but these people had some health issues and they needed to sell it's been on the market for a while um, so they stopped in and somebody was there and said hey can we look at your cabin sure so they walk in the door and you look at the cabin it's just gorgeous they fell in love with it as they're walking out the door they had a sign above the sign above the door and said everything happens for a reason what her Jill, Jill told me. She started crying and she said, hey. <laughs> So that's kind of how it ended. They ended up buying another cabin. They ended up getting the cabin for a really, really reasonable price. They had more property, more water footage, and they got rid of all those other issues. Um, so that's kind of how it ended. Is that's, that's that. They bought another cabin. They got out of there. They aren't friends anymore. <laughs> so there's a lot to absorb there, but. You got questions about any of it, you should be far away. Um, I had the word advice on there because I did this last time for about 300 surveyors. You know, when you get all done, you know, anytime you talk about something like this, there's probably a thousand things you think that you should have said when you're at the trial, in the, in the proceedings, in the um, you know, meeting with the attorney. But in the end, that's how it worked out. I felt like I didn't do my job, to be honest with you, because I thought we were so sure on how this was going to work out. Case what I had said. Yes. The um, easement uh, didn't have much bearing on the judge. The easement? Not really. The easement just was another point of contention for everybody, really. Was there discussions about prescriptive use? No. The question wasn't was discussion about prescriptive use on the easement. No, it really didn't get into that. The easement kind of became, became part of a sideline on his call it. Just another deterrent from that real issue, you know. The, Wait. On the Henry's property, was that, well, first of all, was the ordinary high water mark defined by the DNR? Not on the camp survey, no. Okay. Later it did get defined. But on the Henry's survey, Property, could they not have gone across the lake bed out to the water's edge? They could have, but it wasn't really popular. Because they still would have owned. They still had repairing to the back waters of Bass Lake, yes, but that wasn't walkable, it wasn't movable. You could, it, there was no water in it other than it was a swamp. You know, it was really not usable. It never had been usable, I guess. Was there your involvement with the firm on this? Was there liability on your end, or were, did you go into this with the contractual understanding that you know we're going to go survey this is in litigation, but we're not uh, we'll give our opinion? But. Yeah. The question is, did I have any concern about liability on our end? Right. Right. Um, I guess. You I guess the answer is part of the claim or anything. No, I guess the the answer to that would be any concern on our end. I would say no. Because again, finder of fact, I believe this is the boundary. You know, um, I was concerned as we moved through the process because I was trying to advise the best I could, and you know, with my staff, and business partners, on what we felt was the correct piece of property. But it was what it was, and what the D 
these were very clear in my opinion. I, I wasn't certain I was crossing any lines about how I was telling them to pursue. Anybody else? I got one. Yeah. You said, you said that um, their rights changed as you meander. Once the meander was um, put in there, I, I never heard yeah, that. Yeah, I would, maybe that's the wrong term. I don't know if the rights change, maybe the perception of the rights change would be a better word. And I think that's maybe the way the judge looked at it, being that he signed these. The deeds were ambiguous. He signed that CSM that was now meandered. I mean, I thought it was crystal clear, but, but now there was no order. A watermark there, uh, you know, because really he gave that whole beach, the whole beach to the old. So it's a bunch of land. <laughs> Even that whole beach, just I can't believe it. <laughs> it's just still beyond me how he could do that. You know, his deed was only whatever a small piece of property. He just increased it by how much? And by giving him that piece of property, now he has even more. Uh, you know, he had a problem. Yeah. So do you think the outcome of the DNR issues about them changing the, the frontage of the water will have any bearing on the suit? The question is, do you think the DNR issue with uh, changing the ordinary high water mark would have any bearing on the whole thing? Uh, they want a new cabin now, they don't care anymore. So I don't, I don't know that it would. Um, my suspicion would be that now that Ham Hamburg owns this, now he owns two cabins, maybe he sold it now, but he owns two cabins. My suspicion would be that they probably rectified this and gave it back to the old Hamburg's property so that that property had beach money. That'd be my suspicion on how that happened. Why else would you buy it for 300 grand without the idea that you're going to make it valuable again? You know? Right. Could have made it worth 400 grand just by needing that back. So did they argue the point that if he went to put that fancy wall in and changed it, that that beach wouldn't be They tried to. Yeah, the question is, did they try to argue the point about him changing the shore and putting in the wall? Uh, no, they, I didn't, I, like I said, I didn't get to hear any of the other expert testimony. I got to come in and give my expert testimony. He gave his decision. That's all I got to listen to. Um, you know, we meeting with our attorneys. Um, that was just a whole other road to pursue. And they did it. They, were, they, had, they had kind of a case put together the way they wanted to go. And it was to prove that the deeds were hard called. They matched. There should be no reason to give adverse possession over that money. Anybody else? Yep. What appeal would they have? Just one judge's opinion. They talked about that. Uh, my client talked about appealing and moving forward from that standpoint. Um, and they were just so sick of it, the amount of money that they spent, that they said they just didn't have the heart to appeal it again. And go. The fact that he made the offer, they just said, we're done, we're out of here. We just can't, our lives can't. Yes, I, I'd like to make a comment, a general chairman said that, and I'm re not reminded of from the nature of your presentation, not the details, but the generality. First, I, 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 I like to give a little bit of background. My name is Earl Epstein, and I have served on, uh, uh, for uh, nearly a decade on, on the, 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 the faculty of surveying engineering. I'm also a lawyer who's taught a board of rights. And, and my, advice, my observation and advice is this, to, to, to you and every other surveyor in, in America, when you enter something like this, you need to be fully informed, not just of, uh, of what your opinion is, but to do your work properly. You need to be fully informed of everything that everybody on the other side is going to, 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 to bring up and deal with. From the nature of your presentation and your constant reference to all these other people doing other sorts of things, it seems to me that that's not what was going on here. Yep, I agree. But when I got when I got into this thing with the attorneys, uh, there's a whole other level of this I won't get into. At all, but I, I don't disagree with you. But this is why surveying has passed from the time of Washington and Jefferson to something.
something central to land development in this country to, to its status right now.